1951. Interestingly, today is the one-year anniversary of uh, the first case being found in the United States, first COVID case. One year ago today, uh, it was in Seattle, Washington. And today, one year later, uh, it's like day one because we start with a new president, uh, President Joe Biden, and it thrills me to say President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, I'm very excited about uh, the president and the change for this nation. Uh, this is going to be a different country. It's going to be a country that needs healing, needs direction, uh, needs a new agenda. But Joe Biden is the right person, I believe, for this time. I know him many, many years. Uh, he's been a great friend to me personally. Uh, and uh, I've tried to be a great friend to him good days and bad days. He's been a great friend to New York State. He's been with us on uh, many projects that we've done, uh, many important milestones here in New York. He helped make, make possible when he was vice president. He was in many ways uh, our go-to person during the Obama administration. If I needed to uh, cut the federal bureaucracy and get something done, the vice president was always there and his team was always there. And many of that, uh, his team as vice president are now uh, his team, obviously, uh, as president. So uh, it's exciting. It really is exciting in many ways. I'm also excited about the rescue plan that he's laid out. It's what the nation needs. By the way, it's what the governors had been arguing for for the past year, state and local financing, which is very important. As I said in my budget yesterday, it's now very important that New York gets its fair share of state and local, uh, and we're going to fight very hard for that. But Joe Biden, to his credit, uh, put it in his plan, $350 billion for state and local financing. Now it will go to the Senate and go to the House, and they will uh, carve up that 350, right? They'll divide what does New York get? What does California get? What does Florida get? What does Texas get? Uh, so we have to make sure in that process, New York is represented. But he put the plan on the table that he said he would. Uh, so all good news and a new day and a new sense of hope uh, and a new tone and a new spirit, uh, a more loving, a more loving and healing and uniting presence in Washington. And the president sets the tone. You know, the president is not just another person on Twitter normally. Uh, people look to the president. People listen to the president. The president is a leader. He is a tone setter. And when he is strong enough to use, use words like love, uh, like healing, that's, that's a special person. Uh, because it's hard to show your soul that way. It's hard to be that honest uh, and that authentic. And that's who Joe Biden is. I didn't go to the inaugural because my first job, my first priority is governor of the state of New York. Uh, law enforcement had warned that there could be uh, demonstrations at state capitals by supporters of former President Trump. Former President Trump. I think it's the first time I said that. Uh, and uh, I don't like to call out the state police, and we've called out the state police for today, call out National Guard in what could be a dangerous situation. I don't like to uh, call out any public servant uh, to handle a situation without my being willing to stand next to them in that situation. It's my own. Uh, personal uh, prerogative in my own style, and I call out public employees for dangerous situations, but I'm always there standing next to them. So I didn't want to go to the inaugural and have uh, troopers and National Guard dealing with demonstrations in front of the Capitol. We know how uh, violent uh, these demonstrations can be. We all watched what happened in Washington, so I didn't want to take any chances. Uh, as it turns out, uh, 
the uh, demonstration uh, in New York was, I think it's fair to say, uh, less uh, robust than anticipated. Uh, I just took a look. Uh, there was reportedly one protester. I just took a look outside. I couldn't find the protester. Um, but uh, the protest didn't materialize here in New York. Uh, to the extent that gentleman represents the protest, I could have gone to the inaugural in retrospect. Uh, I have full capacity in my team, and I believe uh, Melissa DeRose and Robin Meek and Gareth Rhodes and Commissioner Zucker could have handled the situation. But better safe than sorry. Um, but uh, it's a new day, and it's a happy day. Overall, today, statewide positivity, 6.8%. Uh, number of deaths, uh, number of tests, 195,000. Statewide deaths, 185 uh, families that are grieving today, and we grieve with them. 400,000 deaths in this nation. And it didn't have to be. It didn't have to be. If we had learned the lessons from COVID in the spring, if it hadn't been politicized the way it was, if the government was more competent, it did not have to be 400,000 people. Uh, we had, we learned many of these lessons, or we should have learned these lessons uh, if we were smart and we were quicker, because we knew what happened in the spring and we knew what was going to happen. Uh, but uh, our leaders, our government failed to make the adjustments. Our political system failed and people died. Statewide hospitalizations up 37, ICU up seven, intubations up five. When you look across the state by region of percent hospitalized, Finger Lakes uh, is still right up there. Finger Lakes, that number is not going to change until the Finger Lakes changes that number. Uh, I don't know what else to say to them. Uh, they're getting their positivity rate has been, had been among the highest. Uh, the hospitalization rate is among the highest. That means more people are going into your hospital. Your nurses and doctors are working harder. Uh, that means more people are going to die. That means more elderly people are at risk. And it's a function of your behavior. At one point in life, it's up to you. It's up to you. It's a function of your behavior. Uh, Mohawk Valley and Long Island which is uh, uh, new to the list and concerning, but that's the top three places in the state in terms of percent of hospitalization. Positivity, Mohawk Valley and Long Island. Uh, Finger Lakes is not in the top three, and I hope that remains, but Mohawk Valley and Long Island have the highest positivity. You look at New York City, the Bronx, uh, and then look at the variance between the Bronx and Manhattan. Uh, double, double the positivity rate. Uh, Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. The period we're in now is a foot race between the vaccine, how many people can you get vaccinated, which is becoming more and more a question of how fast can you produce the vaccine, and how quickly is the infection spreading? Uh, right now, the vaccination rate is a function of the supply, as you'll see in a moment. The infection rate is a function of people's behavior. And right now, the infection rate uh, is on the decline. Caveat, caveat is if one of these new strains of the virus don't take over. That's the caveat. Uh, but this is the basic dynamic that we're in right now. Overall, it's good news. Uh, overall, the positivity rate has been dropping. And it's been dropping across the state. Um, and that is good news. It's in different uh, rates of decline in different parts of the state, but this is the overall statewide average on the seven day. And if you look at the regions, you see all 
basically followed the general curve where it went up, flattened a little bit, uh, and then is coming down as the holidays uh, are more and more in the past. So we hope this continues and we hope a new strain like the UK strain doesn't take over which could change these numbers. Hospitalization rate is what they call a lagging indicator. What does that mean? That means you get infected, you go to a Hanukkah party and you get infected. Several days later, you start to feel ill. Uh, you think maybe it's just a cold, maybe it's the flu. Several days later, you're more concerned and you go get a test. Uh, now you know you have COVID. Several days later, you get sicker and you go into the hospital. You're in the hospital for several days. If you don't get better, you go into the ICU. If you don't get better, you go into the intubation, under intubation, and then question mark. But the hospitalization rate lags the infection rate and the positivity rate. So you see the positivity rate going down. You can still see the hospitalization rate going up. Why? It's the time lag between the infection and the hospitalization rate. When you look at the vaccine administration rate by region, uh, it's up across the state, still with variants. 96% uh, North Country. Who wins? Who's doing the best? Southern Tier, 99%. North Country, 96%. Uh, Long Island, 90%. Western New York, 89%. Central New York, 87%. Mid-Hudson, then Capital Region, then Mohawk Valley, then, nope, then New York City. So uh, it's, it's up, which is the good news. It's varied, which is the bad news. Um, glass half full, glass half empty. On the vaccination of hospital workers, which I am telling you is a priority. If the nurses and doctors get sick, you lose hospital capacity. Hospital capacity will be de determined by staff. That's what it's going to be. No hospital is going to call up and say I'm out of beds. No hospital is going to call up and say I'm out of ventilators. No hospital is going to call up and say I'm out of PPE. A hospital will call up and say, I don't have enough staff because my staff is sick, especially if the UK strain hits. Vaccinate the nurses and doctors. That's why they were the top priority by every federal guidance and by every state guidance. We're now up to 65%. That's better. It's not great. Herd immunity was supposed to be 70 to 90%. I would have liked to see the healthcare workers leading the charge, just as a sign of confidence to New Yorkers. If nurses and doctors take it, it must be safe. Uh, but they're at 65%. Again, that's varied across uh, the state. Some areas are doing better than others. Uh, high of 81 in central New York uh, goes down to a low of uh, 61, 62, Long Island, New York City. So that's a priority, and it's a priority we're going to continue to follow. The pace of the distribution of the vaccine is way up. Week one, this was uh, a new experience for these institutions. Uh, we did 34,000, week two, 54,000, week three, 120. We got more aggressive, talking about percentages, showing transparency, people across the state, what regions were doing what, what facilities were doing what. Uh, publicized it, talked about it, went up higher, 235. We're now 329,000 in week five. Week six, is going to be even higher and dramatically so. Overall statewide uh, total doses 1,156,000. Uh, first doses 
uh, and second doses. But that's way up. 86% of the dosages have been administered, which means they are now in arms, and that's great news. There are 145,000 first dosages that are remaining on hand. We're averaging 65,000 doses per day. So that means, at this rate, we only have two or three days of supply. Uh, we'll start to get the next week's allocation, but what's clear now is we're going to be going from week to week. And you will see a constant pattern of basically running out, waiting for the next week's allocation, and then starting up again. Uh, we're trying to smooth it out, but we're also trying to get it out as fast as possible. But that's where we are now. It's going to be a week-to-week -week allocation uh, situation. And at this rate, uh, we're going to be out in two days. And we're going to have to start to move the next allocation quickly. We have 1,200 vaccine distributors around the state now. Uh, it's a very large network of distributors. We also have other distributors who are ready to come online, who we have prepared to come online. Uh, frankly, the 1,200 distributors are more than we need right now. We have more of a distribution network than we have product, so to speak. We have 1,200 distributors, uh, but we have so many distributors that we can't supply them all, and you will see distributors who run out of supply. So when distributors say, uh, I'm running out, they're right. Uh, we want to make sure distributors don't schedule any appointments for which they don't have a definitive allocation because we don't know what we're going to get next week and we don't know where we're going to distribute it next week. So don't schedule an appointment unless you know your allocation for the next week. Uh, otherwise you have to cancel appointments and it adds to the uh, chaos which is already inherent in the system. Uh, when the federal government decided to say 65 plus were open and this was open and this was open and this was open, uh, but there was no supply, they created tremendous anxiety, right? Only Jesus with loaves and fishes could handle the situation that the federal government created uh, because they created such a demand and then they never increased the supply. But uh, this large distribution network that we're putting in place, we're anticipating more supply. I'd rather have, be in the situation where we have more distribution waiting on supply than supply waiting on distribution, right? As soon as we get it, we want to be able to send it out. Uh, and that's why we have such a large distribution network. I also believe you're going to see more production. Uh, knock for Micah. And uh, Johnson & Johnson may be coming online. Now we hear maybe March. Uh, AstraZeneca may be coming online. Uh, more Pfizer production maybe in the second, uh, maybe in the second quarter. More Moderna production. So our distribution network is up and running. We ju we're just waiting on the supply. Uh, but we're in a position that when we get the supply, we will be able to move the supply. And that's, that's the position we should be in, and I feel good about that. What's, what else is happening is as we move allocation faster, the vaccines are becoming more scarce and harder to find. Fairness becomes more important, all right? Because now you're getting down to we only have a very few uh, vaccines that we're allocating because so many are going out the door, fairness is important. And I want to remember uh, where we are in general. 
there are three groups that are now eligible. The health care, nurses, doctors, uh, patient-facing staff, uh, therapists, etc. cetera, health care. You then have what's called 1B, essential workers, police officers, firefighters, uh, public safety officers, transit workers, grocery food, teachers. That's 1B. And then you have 65 plus, uh, just general m members uh, of the public who are 65 plus. Why? Because older people are more susceptible uh, to COVID. Those are the three categories that are open. I want to keep it fair among those three, right? So healthcare workers, there are about 1.3 million who haven't been vaccinated. That's about 21% of the eligible universe. Essential workers, they're about 1.7. That's about 27% of the eligible universe. 65 plus, it's 3.2 million people. That's 52% of the eligible universe. Uh, theoretically and ideally, if you had 100 vaccines and they said, how do you distribute those 100 vaccines fairly among these eligible individuals? You would say 21% go to the healthcare workers, 27% go to the essential workers, and 52% go to 65 plus. Uh, that would be fair among those eligible people. And that's what we're trying to do to the extent practicable, okay? The way we distributed it, distribute it is we distribute it by region. A region gets an allocation. The region's allocation is based on a pure percentage of their population. If a region is 14% of the state's population, they get 14%. It is then goes to the provider network. The provider network is in two parts. One is the governmental, the public side, and they basically operate the local health department, uh, county department of health, city department of health. That's what they run. Uh, if they have a public hospital, they run the public hospital. The private sector runs the majority of the providers. Hospitals, pharmacies, uh, federally qualified uh, health community facilities. The hospitals, to give you an idea, in this state, we have about 200, roughly. We have about 15 public, and the rest are all private. So hospitals are private, pharmacies are private, CVS, Walgreens, et cetera. Uh, and the community health care facilities are private. So that is duplicated in every region. County executive is in charge of the local health department. Mayor is in charge of the local health department. The private facilities are private facilities. Each provider has a priority, and this is important. Pharmacies are to be doing people who are 65 plus. Hospitals are be, to be doing the healthcare workers. Why? Because uh, healthcare workers are related to hospitals, and we don't want 65-year-olds walking into hospitals. Uh, pharmacies. Uh, are better, better accommodated to handle 65 plus. The city and county departments of health are supposed to be doing the essential workers, police, fire, teachers. And the police, fire, teachers are supposed to be working on self-administration programs. So the local county department of health can just hand them an allocation and say, here you go, chief of the police, you have your medics administer it. Here you go, chief of the fire department, you have your EMS administer it. Uh, here you go, teachers, you work with your local provider to administer it. That's how this should be working. Each provider must follow the priority 
or else the allocations are unfair. That's why we push and stress the prioritization. And that's why it's in the law. If everybody vaccinates everyone, then it's going to be unfair to someone. If a local health department receives an allocation which is calibrated to their number of essential workers, but they give it to people who are 65 plus, then the essential workers are going to have less of an allocation. If the pharmacies that are supposed to be doing 65 plus, if they give it to essential workers, it depletes the allocation for the 65 plus. Uh, that's why it's important, because we want it as fair as possible. I understand everybody wants it. I understand people under 65 are saying, why not me? I understand there are thousands of people over 65 who can't get a uh, vaccine. I get dozens of calls every day from people who are 70, 80, 90 years old who say, I try calling all day long, I try on the internet all day long, my daughter tries all day long, my son tries all day long, we can't find an appointment to get a vaccine. That's true, that is very true. I talk to police officers who say, I can't get the vaccine yet. My police department says they don't have enough. That's true. The best we can do is be fair to everyone. And uh, that's what we're trying to do. Appreciating we don't have enough supply. We don't. And at this rate of supply, it takes seven and a half months to get enough vaccine for the currently eligible population, okay? I'm 63. I know I look a lot older, but I'm only 63. I'm not eligible. At this rate, I'm not going to be eligible for eight months because the current eligible population, it's going to take us seven and a half months to get to them. So I get the frustration. Uh, but I want to at least be able to say we were fair with what we had. We were fair with what we had. Uh, the geographic, so how do we allocate? First, geographically by region. Every region gets their population allocation, period. Then by eligible group, 21% healthcare, 52% 65, 27% healthcare workers, essential workers. Then a priority for the more effective providers. You've all seen the priority, the provider list. Some providers are much more efficient than other providers. Uh, you want to get the vaccine out the door, so uh, we prioritize within that group the providers that uh, are higher performing. On top of that, uh, we have a mandate for social equity. Uh, I don't want it to be the places, the poor places, and uh, black community, Hispanic community wind up getting left out because they don't have a hospital and they don't have a doctor's office uh, and they don't have a chain pharmacy. So special efforts in public housing, uh, in churches, uh, in community, uh, through community groups, which we have been doing. I've been working myself with uh, public housing, the state is set up, sites in public housing, with uh, black churches. Uh, we have SOMOS that is doing a beautiful job, and uh, Northwell that is setting up a lot of pop-up sites for us. So the equity is also very important to us. But the issue is supply. Uh, and that's not going to change. We got 300,000 doses, then we went to 239. Uh, last week we were at 250. At this rate, uh, if you were to receive 300,000 vaccines, it's going to take six months. Uh, if you receive 250, which is what we're receiving now, it's going to take seven months. We just received uh, the allocation uh, number for next week. It's 250,000 again, so it didn't go up. Uh, I urge the president to do whatever he can to increase the supply. 
um, the Pfizer and Moderna drugs cannot sell by law to a state. I tried. Apparently, they only have what's called an emergency authorization use, an EAU. They're not licensed to sell. Uh, it's a very limited federal approval. So states can't buy, uh, private individuals can't buy. Uh, it's not allowed by the Pfizer-Moderna approval. So it's going to be up to the federal government. Uh, but whatever they can do, that's going to be job one. Something else I'm concerned about on the theory of it's been one year. Learn the lesson in life. It's okay to get knocked on your rear end. It's really not okay, but it's unavoidable. Life is going to knock you on your rear end. Uh, two pieces of advice. Get up. Get up. Second, learn the lesson that knocked you on your rear end. And uh, this country hasn't done that. We know this. Viruses mutate. We know that. This virus is mutating. We know that. Uh, so far, the mu mutated strains uh, are different and are more dangerous. The UK strain spreads much more quickly. Uh, CDC casually mentions that the UK strain can take over by March, in which case you'll see our infection rate go like this. And then you'll say, why didn't we vaccinate the nurses and doctors? Uh, there's a South African strain that may or may not be more lethal. There's a Brazilian strain that may or may not be more lethal. We're seeing the UK strain spread. Uh, we have two more cases linked to the Saratoga Spring uh, spread and two cases in Suffolk County. Wadsworth is testing. We have not found the South, Ameri South Africa strain or the Brazilian strain in New York. I believe it's just a matter of time. And I believe it's just a matter of time until there is a strain that is much more lethal. And unfortunately, I believe you have to anticipate a strain that is vaccine resistant. It is almost a matter of probability. When we talk about these strains, there are dozens and dozens of mutations. Probability suggests there will be a strain, there will be a mutation that is vaccine resistant, as frightening as that sounds. The flu mutates every year. There's a new flu vaccine every year. Uh, there could be a strain that requires a new vaccine. That's a possibility. And we've done so much vaccine work, it's also possible that we could come up with a quick new vaccine. But you then have to administer that vaccine all over again. So you are playing right now Russian roulette with this virus. You know it's mutating around the globe. Why are we still allowing international people to fly into our airports without tests? Why would we do that? One year later, one year later, why don't we learn the lesson of a year ago? How did New York wind up in this situation? It flew here from the UK. It flew from Italy. It was never the China virus. It was the mutated virus from the UK and from Italy and from France. And you know what's happening today? The UK virus is still flying into JFK. The Brazil virus is still flying into JFK. Why? Why wouldn't you say all international travelers have to be tested? It is just the basic common sense and realizing the lesson of last year. Moving forward in this new year, our new president, 
we are ready. We are energized. I'm feeling good. We are strong. This state is stronger than it's ever been. We had a horrendous experience last year with COVID, but it made us stronger. That which doesn't kill you makes you stronger, and we are the stronger for it. And I feel it, and I believe it. We're going to battle COVID. We're going to deal with the economics in the budget. We're going to make sure Washington gives us our fair share of state and local financing. We're going to reopen the economy, as we're now doing, safely and smartly. And build, baby, build. My own expression, build, baby, build. This is a perfect moment in time. Listen to FDR. Listen to all the greats. Private sector is slow. Private economy is slow. People are out of work. Money is cheap. Build. Build. Like we built airports and bridges and subways. Build. And build in New York. That's better than it has ever been. And that's exactly what we're doing. And we're building today. Today. We're waiting for no one. We create our own destiny. I believe that. Uh, and no one is better at creating destiny and shaping the future than the people of New York State because they are New York tough. Questions? Thank you, Governor. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your window. We'll take a brief moment to compile the Q&A roster. <clears throat> Governor, your first question comes from John Campbell of Gannett. John, your line is now open. Please unmute your microphone. Hi, Governor. You've uh, heard you speak many times about the importance of uh, vaccinating black and brown communities and, and historically disenfranchised communities. Is there a reason why the state hasn't released demographic information about who has been vaccinated? And can you commit to doing that in the future? Uh, we are... We are not in control of all of the information that is collected. Uh, you have local governments uh, that are doing distribution. You have pharmacies that are doing distribution. You have community groups. Different groups have collected different information. Uh, my understanding is not all the groups have collected demographic data. Uh, People also have a right to refuse to answer. But uh, we are putting together as much information as we can. And uh, as we get it uh, and confirm it, then we make it available. I mean, I've made available, you know, John, <laughs> you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. I put out all this information the past few briefings Here's the distribution by region. Here's the distribution by hospital. Uh, here's what St. Rose did in uh, Buffalo. Uh, and then reporters say, oh, you're giving out information on St. Rose in Buffalo. Uh, you're picking on them. You know, but so, yes, uh, information that we get that is correct, uh, we will uh, give out. Right now, the only information I trust, frankly, is the regional information. Next question, operator. Governor, your next question comes from Jeff Cole at WWNY-TV. Jeff, your line is open. Please unmute your microphone. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, I just listened to the formula on how vaccines are distributed. Something doesn't seem to be adding up for Jefferson County, and I'll explain. Uh, Jefferson County requested 400 to 1,000 doses last week and got none. Samaritan Medical Center in Watertown asked for 2,000 doses this week and learned it'll be getting none. And to date, County Public Health here in Jefferson County has done 290 doses, and they admit that's very, very low. So county officials are concerned that the difficulty in getting doses is due to those resources going to state-run clinics, bypassing counties and hospitals, so my question, are counties without a state-run clinic inadvertently getting shortchanged? Are they not getting their fair share? Could something change, or are residents here expected to drive 70 or 90 miles away to Syracuse or Potsdam to a state-run clinic to get a shot? Thank you. Yeah. Jeff, let's make sure we understand the rules. I'll ask Gareth if he has any additional information. Uh, 
a hospital uh, asked for 2,900. That's irrelevant. I, as governor of New York, am asking the federal government for a million next week. I'm asking for five million. I'm asking for 10 million. It's irrelevant. Uh, they give me an allocation. Um, it's irrelevant what a hospital asks for. They give me an allocation. We then say, by region, here is your fair allocation as a percentage of population. Broken down within that, 52% has to go to people who are 65 plus, and the providers who are providing for the people who are 65 plus, roughly. 27% to the uh, essential workers and the providers who are providing to the essential workers. 21% to the healthcare workers and the providers who are providing to the healthcare workers. So, hospitals are doing the healthcare workers. County government is supposed to be doing the essential workers or city government. The pharmacies Mass vaccination sites are doing the 65 plus. That's the allocation. Uh, if you are, if we have distributed the allocation for the essential workers, then you don't get the allocation from the 65 plus. 65 plus have an allocation and a group of providers who do that. Healthcare has an allocation of group of providers that do that. And uh, the essential workers basically get from the local governments. If the local governments have been giving to 65 plus, that by definition is going to de deplete the number that they have for essential workers. So it's a scarce resource and we're trying to allocate it fairly. I don't know the specifics. Do you know anything about that? Sure, and we, we also track very closely the, the, the residents of the person who gets vaccinated, even if they don't get vaccinated in the county specifically. For example, more than 5,000 Jefferson County residents we know have received at least one dose of the vaccine. It's about 4.27% of the county's population, which if you look statewide is actually a fairly good percentage. And this, of course, we are very cognizant of, the, of that in some of these very rural communities, finding providers who are willing to offer the vaccine sometimes is more of a challenge. We're working through that, and to the extent we can add more of these sites in some of these rural communities, we will. But as the governor discussed before, really the issue here is supply. So when we have more supply, we can open up more sites and make sure that access is expanded into really all corners of the state. Next question, operator. And remember, the mass vaccination sites are primarily for 65 plus, which is over half of the population. Uh, and that's pharmacies, community-based facilities, and mass vaccination sites. Next question, operator. Governor, next up we have Lisa Colangelo from Newsday. Lisa, your line is open. Please unmute your microphone. Hi, how are you? How are you, Lisa? Um, very good, thank you. You said distribution sh sites should not make more appointments than supply. So I'm wondering about the mass state sites because we're hearing from people whose appointments were canceled at some of those sites because of uh, supply, and then they have to start all over again uh, to get an appointment. So how should those be handled? How can that be handled differently? You're not talking about Stony Brook, are you? Maybe. Uh-huh. Well, that's different. Melissa knows that answer. So there have been no cancellations of any appointments at any of the state-run sites. We were incredibly conservative with the number of appointments that we set up there. We, as the governor said, took the approach of get it up and running, and then we know we can scale up very quickly in case we get an influx from the feds. We can take Javits from 1,000 a day to 10,000 a day like that. 
but we're gonna only do 1,000 per day. And for the next few weeks, as it's been scheduled out, we are confident that we have scheduled appointments for which the vaccine we are going to have because we did it at such a low manageable level. So other than Stony Brook, where there was the, the issue earlier with the, le with the link that's currently under investigation by the Inspector General and a couple of the other sites where the links had been shared prematurely, um, and we went over that last week, there have been no state appointment sites um, that have been canceled. Lisa, Stony Brook was a fraud situation. Stony Brook was a link to a Stony Brook site that somebody stole and disseminated, and people were then signing up uh, before the site was actually active. That's what happened there. That was just a scam and a fraud. Uh, and people did sign up to the fraud, but uh, that that was never operational, that site. I understand that they signed up and then there was no appointment, but they signed up to a stolen site. Next question, operator. Next, we have Kesha Cluckley from Bloomberg. Kesha, your line is now open. Please unmute your microphone. Hi, Governor. Um, just a quick question. Are, are there any regulations or rules in place stopping people from going to other vaccination sites that are outside their region. We've heard of some cases of people maybe traveling um, outside of more populated regions to less populated regions to try to get the vaccination. Yeah, I don't believe so. Uh, maybe the assembled panel does. I don't believe so. I know you have people who are desperate, Keisha, and who literally will shop sites all over. I know we have people who go to state sites uh, that are two hours away to get a vaccine. Uh, I know we have a lot of people in the Buffalo area who go to Rochester uh, to get vaccines. Uh, I don't believe there are any, well, by definition, there are no state sites, right? because if you're a resident of the state, you're eligible. But does anyone know if there are local sites that? You no, know, the governor's correct. The state-run sites are open to anyone as long as you're a New York State resident. Um, and again, they're regional hubs that are strategically in places where we know there's population centers, but people can travel around the state um, and reach any of them. And we do track, in addition to where we're allocating, the vaccinations, we're tracking who is consuming the vaccinations to make sure that county by county uh, there's parity and equity. Um, so, and we haven't seen any significant issues at this point. I know that New York City, I believe, Mayor de Blasio has said that the city sites are for city residents. And so I do know that municipality by municipality are treating it differently than the state sites. But if you're a New York State resident, you can go to any of the state sites. Next question, operator. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your window. Raise hand. I have a question. Who do I ask? That is the question. Anyone else, operator? As a reminder, uh, if you'd like to ra ask a question, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your window. Operator, let's take one more if you have it. If you don't have it, that's okay too. Governor, your last question comes from Bill Mahoney at Politico. Bill, your line is now open. Please unmute your microphone. Hey, Governor. The um, Assembly is currently, as we speak, passing a constitutional amendment to overhaul the redistricting amendment that you championed seven years ago. Have you had a chance to look at this at all? And do you have any thoughts on the changes that they're making to your signature reforms? I have not looked at anything. Uh, and when I do, I'll have an opinion. In the meantime, Bill Mahoney, can you see me? I can. Go Bills. Go Bills, Bill Mahoney. No, I have not seen uh, what the uh, Assembly's talking about. Thank you guys very much.